usihlalweni akakubhlelwane ukhanselwane yohlanganisiza izwe zaseningizimu sibukana ingqo nezasenyakatho kambe owakuyithu mageba usekhangwe embalithizeni yaselangeni Hello everyone, welcome to ASR, African Stories Realized. This is a full summary of Shakai Lembe Season 1. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's get into it. Shakai Lembe is set in the 1700s and explores the roots of the great warrior king, weaving together various narratives inspired by history but fueled by imagination. The series was produced by Bomb Productions and showcases the story of Shaka Zulu from an early childhood all the way to his rise to power. The first episode opens up with a breathtaking mountainside scenery. The narrator, a woman with a captivating and enigmatic voice, introduces herself as Mkabai, the daughter of Jama. We then switch to a young Shaka being bullied by his peers, taunting him as a mama's boy. Determined to prove his bravery, he confronts a bee's nest and retrieves honey without harm. His friends are taken aback, recognizing the power associated with royalty, sorcery, and divinity. As his friends retreat, the boy presents the honey to his mother in a touching opening scene. We then flash back to a stunning body of water with beautiful women. We are introduced to Nandi, a spirited princess of the land, who fearlessly jumps off the cliff into the water, defying rules and displaying bravery which her friends deem as unladylike. We are then introduced to Nandi's village, a warm and secure place. Nandi engages in a heartfelt conversation with her mother, the queen, who reveals that Nandi will attend her cousin's wedding the following day and hints at her daughter's own impending marriage. Nandi, rebellious as ever, questions the traditional practice of arranged marriages. Despite her defiance, Nandi's love for her mother shines through, indicating a loving and caring relationship between the two. A fire then breaks out as deviants venture into the grazing fields near Nandi's village. It is revealed to be Prince Zwide and his men, who are driven by the desperation brought to their land by the drought. The owner of the cattle tries to stop Zwide, resulting in a fatal confrontation, where the Ndwandwe warriors kill the man and his companions. Meanwhile, Nandi and her delegation proceed to the wedding the following day. On their journey, they encounter another party of hunters, singing joyfully as they carry their freshly caught game. This encounter serves as an introduction to Prince Senzagakor, the son of King Jam. Nandi and the prince lock eyes, instantly forming a connection. Greeting each other, Prince Senza begins charming Nandi, praising her beauty. Nandi playfully flirts back despite being promised to another. Their flirty exchange comes dangerously close to breaking diplomatic protocol due to their shared royal status. Senza persists but is made aware of Nandi's engagement. The prince is not deterred, saying whoever caught the bird hasn't cooked it yet, suggesting that as long as Lobola hasn't been paid yet, he still has a chance. Senza inquires on a timeline for their return, indicating that he will be anticipating them. Meanwhile, Senza returns to his home. This is our introduction to Guanobamba, the Zulu palace. A princess enters the palace where some of the men are skinning an animal. She teases the men and playfully engages with them. This introduces Mgabai, Senza's older sister and the narrator of the story. Mgabai proceeds to the royal court where she greets the king. The conversation initially revolves around the drought in the north, where the Ndwandwe reside, but it eventually shifts to Senza and Nandi's encounter. The king teases Senza's fondness of women, and a council member reminds the king of his own youthful lusts. The king reiterates Mgabai's role in choosing Senza's wife, reinforcing her authority within the family and matters of the state. Prince Senza returns to the area where he met Nandi. Him and his friends eagerly anticipate her return. On their way home, Nandi and her party encounter Senza and his party. Senza continues to shower Nandi with compliments, but Nandi's guard becomes protective and irritated at Senza's breaches of protocol. However, Senza humbly apologizes, making amends by offering his day's kill. The tensions dissipate and moments later, Nandi and her best friend find an opportunity to go to the river alone, playfully enticing the Zulu prince to follow. 
at the river. Nandi and her friend are having a joyful time until Zwidi and his men arrive and begin harassing them. Nandi tries to stand up to them but they overpower her and her friend. Just in the nick of time, Senza and his men rush to their rescue, resulting in a fierce fight. Senza, being a prince, ends up killing one of Zwidi's men, an act that symbolically declares war. An enraged Zwidi injures one of Senza's men with a thrown spear. But Nandi's security detail arrives to aid them. Zwide and his men are outnumbered, so he retreats. Senza's heroic act earns him praise for saving the princess, but he remains modest, emphasizing that he merely did what was necessary. He promises not to forget Nandi, highlighting his growing affection for her. Meanwhile, Zwide conducts burial rites for his fallen comrade as tensions escalate. Zwide returns to Edungu, the Ndwandwe palace with the stolen cattle, and his friend's corpse. The king is displeased that Zwide has broken old peace treaties as his hunger for war becomes more evident. Although he justifies his actions as a means to feed his people, his lack of expertise in matter of state are apparent. The king confronts Zwide's mother, a witch, for encouraging her son to stir up trouble in the south and declares that Zwide will never be king. Zwide's mother retreats to her lair, followed by King Langa. Tragically, the king is killed by hyenas. He is buried in no time and his royal servant is sacrificed according to their customs. The Ndwande royal council assembles and one of Zwide's sons accuses the queen of witchcraft and murder, having followed her to the secret lair and witnessed the hyenas attack his father. The story returns to Elangeni where Nandi and her party are joyously entertaining royal guests. They are suddenly informed that her betrothed is a fat, intoxicated man dancing wildly, much to Nandi's disappointment. Nandi's mother tries to convince her to embrace her fiancé. However, Nandi confesses her love for Senza. The queen suspects foul play, suggesting a love potion or bewitchment. It appears that there is some bad blood between the Zulus and Nandi's mother's family. Back at the Zulu palace, Senza reports his encounter with Zwide to the council and a diplomatic party is dispatched to Zwide's palace to assess the state of the peace treaty. The Zulu diplomatic party arrives at Ndwandwe, but the episode ends when Zwide declares war by killing two members of the party. Episode 2 begins in the aftermath of Zwide's declaration of war and the untimely death of King Langa. Asangoma is tasked with investigating Queen Ntombazi for King Langa's murder, putting her on trial by poison. The queen undergoes the test and passes, proving her innocence. However, Zwide remains unsatisfied and takes matters into his own hands, slaughtering his half-brother as he rallies his people for war against the Zulu kingdom. In a shocking twist, it is revealed that the queen used animal intestine to prevent herself from swallowing the poison exposing her resourcefulness and determination. Back at the Zulu Kingdom, the diplomatic party returns with confirmation of an imminent war within Dwandre, led by the bloodthirsty Zwide. The Zulu leaders gather to discuss potential allies, but Mgabai dismisses Senza's attempts to align with Nandi's Elangeni Kingdom. Instead, she sets her sights on forging an alliance with the powerful Mtetwa Kingdom. We are introduced to the Mteto tribe through Prince Godongwana, who is engaging in trade with a colonizer for valuable resources. The encounter showcases the Mteto kingdom as the most advanced kingdom encountered thus far. Prince Godongwana returns to his kingdom where we meet his father, King Job, a comical and charismatic figure. Mkabai travels to the Mteto kingdom to plead for assistance in the upcoming war. However, King Job is petty and refuses to help the Zulus unless Princess Mgabai reconsiders his marriage proposal. Prince Gorongwana recognizes the threat posed by Zwide and desires to support the Zulus, but he laments his lack of power, acknowledging that he can only assist if his father allows it. Meanwhile, the Zulu kingdom receives a prophecy about a future great king who will lead them to victory. King Jama, the Zulu leader, receives the vague prophecy 
which assures him of eventual salvation, but emphasizes the need to keep Senza out of the upcoming war. King Jama shares the prophecy with his children and instructs Senza to guide the women, children, and livestock to safety, while the rest of the tribe prepares for battle. News of the impending war reaches Elangeni, and Senza, who received Nandi's chastity bees earlier in the episode, sends her a message, asking her to meet him at the river. As night falls, the Ndwande army arrives at the Zulu kingdom, ready for war. The two armies line up, with the Ndwande forces greatly outnumbering the Zulus. The Zulu warriors attempt to maintain distance from Zwide's men to avoid their deadly spears, but in a cunning maneuver, Zwide and a select few disguised themselves, infiltrated the Zulu lines, and provoked needless casualties. The episode ends with the ensuing bloodshed, and Mkabai's voiceover sets the stage for a bleak aftermath of the first battle. Mama. <sighs> Episode 3, the story picks up at dawn with the Zulu warriors about to be defeated by the Ndwande army. However, the Mteto warriors led by Godongwan arrive and defeat the Ndwande, taking Zwide and his surviving men captive. Meanwhile, Nandi and Senza meet and he tells her about the prophecy. They consummate their relationship and Senza promises to make Nandi his queen. After the battle, Senza returns to find that his friends did not make it. I'm not sure but I think at least one of them was his brother. The Zulu elders concede their weaknesses were exposed and insist that Senza Gakona has to marry. He pleads with his mother to let him marry Nandi but she does not entertain the idea. Like I said before, it seems like there's bad blood between the Zulus and Nandi's family. There's not a lot of warriors in the Zulu and the Elangeni clans. It seems like those clans have more women than the other clans. Godongwana arrives in Mteta with the captives, and his father demands that Ndwandwe pledge loyalty to the Mteta. Back in Ndwandwe, the queen argues with the council, refusing to pledge loyalty to Mteta, but still plotting to get Swede back. Nandi's husband arrives in Elangeni for wedding negotiations, and Nandi tells him that she is not a virgin, but to her surprise, he does not care. Back at the Mteta kingdom, Swede's mother, the queen, arrives to bargain for her son. She quickly realizes that the king is easily manipulated due to his visible dementia. His sons discuss the king's dwindling insanity, and Zwide's mother seizes the opportunity, bewitching and seducing the king's favorite son. When it was time for Zwide and the Ndwande to pledge their loyalty to the Mteta, the king instead released Zwide to his mom and lined up his own sons for execution after his favorite convinced him that his brothers were plotting against the senile king. The episode ends with the execution of Godongwana's brothers. Godongwana tries to flee but is struck with a spear to the back. It appears that he's still alive. Episode 4 picks up where last week left off, with Prince Godongwana making a narrow escape. With the help of his lover, the royal healer, Balega, Godongwana flees and finds refuge in the kingdom where his sister was married off to. A manhunt ensues, led by Godongwana's only remaining brother, Mawewe. Eventually, they catch Godongwana and his lover trying to flee again. Balega is executed, and Godongwana is pushed into a flooded river that streams down a waterfall. Meanwhile, Zwide returns to the Ndwandwe and receives a hero's welcome, despite losing the battle with the Zulus and allowing himself to be captured by the Mteta. Upon his return, Zwide punishes his remaining brother for not doing enough to get him back. The less said about the punishment, the better. Meanwhile, Senzagakona goes through with his initiation, but returns to find that his father, King Jama, has passed away. 
This means preparation for Senza's coronation are already underway. However, a royal delegation from Elangeni arrives, disrupting the preparations after it was discovered that Nandi is pregnant. Senza denies that he impregnated Nandi, bringing shame to the Elangeni princess. After being confronted by his sister and mother, Senza concedes that the child could be his and they agree to keep it a secret until the baby is born, when they can confirm if it truly is a Zulu. At this point, Senza's ego has gotten the better of him, and he wrongly believes that the prophecy foreshadowed last week was referring to him. He meets up with Nandi to apologize, but the damage to her reputation has already been done. Her engagement to the fat prince is off, and her family is eager to marry her off to a commoner to hide the shame she has brought upon the Elangeni kingdom. On the eve of Senza's coronation, Nandi goes into labor. The episode ends with Senza being coronated as Mkabai arrives in Elangeni just as Nandi gives birth. Mkabai will use an ancient technique of going into a bull's kraal with the baby in her hands. If the bull doesn't charge at her and the baby, it will confirm that the baby is of Zulu blood. In episode 5, the story continues after the birth of Shaka. Senza and the Zulus take responsibility for Nandi's son, and Senza meets his son for the first time. He proposes marriage to Nandi, setting the stage for a future sibling rivalry over the Zulu throne. Nandi and Senza Gakona have a royal Zulu wedding and consummate their marriage. Meanwhile, Balega, who was thought to be dead, is saved and nursed back to health by the missionaries who traded with Prince Godongwana back in episode 2. Prince Godongwana is also found unconscious at the bottom of the waterfall by hunters. It is not clear from which tribe the hunters are from. Meanwhile, the Ndwanda tribe is suffering from a drought as rumors spread that Zuida's mother is a witch. One of the Ndwanda maidens reports seeing the queen cheat in the trial by poison, which was used to find out if the queen had killed King Zuide. Zuida confronts his mother, who denies it, but he starts to suspect her witching ways. Zuida's mother visits her goblin son, who reveals that the queen promised he could return to the Ndwande once Zuida became king. However, the queen goes back on her word, suggesting they wait until after the drought is over. The goblin son longs to join society and comes into contact with some Ndwande boys, who attack him, but one of them is killed by the queen's hyenas, which came to the goblin's protection. At the same time, the queen performs a ritual to bring back the rain, which requires a sacrifice. Zuida and his men track the hyenas to their lair, kill them, and capture the goblin, who reveals that he is Zuida's brother. The Ndondwe Sangoma suggests that the goblin is the source of the drought and that burning it is the only way to bring back the rain. Zuida confronts his mother for the second time about her witching ways and gets confirmation that she did kill the king. The queen makes a passionate plea to Zuida and the Ndwandwe, freeing her goblin son and summoning rain to fall from the skies. The episode ends with heavy rain falling on the Ndwandwe kingdom and Zuida forgiving his mother. Episode 6 picks up with the revelation that Prince Godongwana had been rescued by hunters from the Thubi tribe. After he had been nursed back to health, he parted ways with the Thubi hunters who advised him to seek refuge with King Bungan. Upon arriving in Thubi, he told the Sangoma king he wasn't a traitor and can be of use to him, presenting him with the lion he killed. It is here he was given his new name, Dingiswai, the exiled one. During his exile, Dinyuswayo crossed paths with the missionary lady he had traded with before, who reveals to him that Balega is still alive. Word would eventually arrive Guam Tet, that the prince is still alive, and Mteto warriors would arrive Kwasubi to apprehend him. Dinyuswayo tried to flee, but was cornered by one of the Mteto warriors, who comes close to killing him in a struggle, but is saved by one of the men traveling with the missionary lady. Meanwhile in the Zulu kingdom, we are reintroduced to a young Shaka and his extended family comprising of Senza's seven other wives and multiple siblings, including his younger half-brother Dingani and his sister Princess Nomka. 
Nandi continued to groom a young Shaka for his destiny as the Zulu king, encouraging him to show off his smarts and bravery. The Zulu men go on a hunt, where Shaka undermines Senza with his bravery, steering a hostile elephant away. The king, realizing his authority is being threatened, belittles the young Shaka's achievements, attributing them to naivety of youth. Word arrives in the Zulu kingdom that Nandi's father, the king of Alangeni, has passed away, but Senza refuses to allow Shaka to accompany his mother to the funeral. While Nandi is at the funeral, it's revealed that Nandi's family is not happy with it, and we get the first mention of the Ijab, a traditional Zulu dance. Meanwhile, Shaka reveals to Senza Gakon that Nandi shared the prophecy of a great Zulu king with him, and that is his destiny. With the Ijabu approaching, Senza grew increasingly paranoid with King Yambusa refusing to attend the event during the mourning period for the Elangeni king. Kings from the other tribes followed Nyambosa's lead and declined the invitation, something which Mkabai warned Senza would happen. But unlike his father, Senza does not value his sister's counsel. On the day of the Ijabu, it all comes to a head when Senza strikes Shaka out of frustration and paranoia. Nandi rushes to her son's defense and the episode ends with the king banishing Nandi from the Zulu kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 7 picks up when it's revealed that Deniswayo and Ngomane have been captured by a group of slave traders working for the Portuguese. The slave traders took Deniswayo and the rest of the people that had been captured to a camp while they waited for the slave ship that would take them to Europe. While in captivity, Deniswayo and Ngomane hatched an escape plan and on the day the ship arrived to take them, they rose up against their capturers, with most of them escaping. Once they were free, Ngomane tried to take the Nyuswayo back to Mtetwa, but they were seemingly recaptured by the slave master. Meanwhile, Nandi and Shaka made their way back to Elangeni after being banished by Senza Gakon. On their way to Elangeni, Nandi's delegation is attacked by what appears to be an assassination attempt by one of Senza's wives, Bibi. Shaka and his mother fight back to no avail. Fortunately, they are saved by some Zulu warriors who escort Nandi's delegation the rest of the way to Elangeni. Nandi arrives in Elangeni, but her brother, who is now king, gives her a cold reception, humiliating her and Shaka in front of the entire tribe. Nandi and Shaka continue to get treated badly by the Elangeni people, with the king forcing Nandi to do manual labor she never did before, like picking up cow dung. The boys in the village bullied Shaka, and many of the Elangeni women called him a mama's boy that would never be king. Her mother sends Gerengwane, a warrior from Kwabe. Gerengwane arrives determined to take Nandi and her kids back to Kwabe. Nandi denies his offer, but things change when the young Shaka, fed up with being bullied by his cousin, King Gabi's son, attacks the Elangeni prince, leaving him wounded. <laughs> Episode 8 picks up with Dingy Swayo and Ngomani being taken to Guamabutu after their recapture where King Makasana sentenced them to execution. However, Balega would appear and plead for Dinyuswayo's life, who in turn requested the king spare Ngomani as well, who had declared him a traitor, but would soon realize the leadership qualities the future Mteto king possessed. Ngomani was released, but not before pledging his loyalty to Dinyuswayo, who stayed behind to catch up with Balega and learn from King Makasana, making it two kings he had studied under now. King Yambose passes, but even in his last days, he still longed for his prodigal son, Godongwan. But Mawewe moves in on the Mteto throne regardless. Word of King Yambos' passing arrives in Mabudu. King Makasana encourages the Yuswayo to march to Mteto and challenge his brother for the now vacant throne, even offering manpower in support with the Subi expected to join him. As Mawewe prepares to take the Mteto throne, 
word arrives in the kingdom of Godongwana's return, with Ngomani defecting with some of them Teto soldiers as Mawewe rushes to coronate himself as king. Meanwhile, in Kwabe, we get an eight-year time jump, with Nandi and Shaka having settled in. We're introduced to an older Shaka, who has become a mischievous young man, till Gedengwa, who has now built a bond with Nandi, offers Shaka and his friend Nomo train under him in the Kwabe army. But Shaka still clings on to hope that his father will But Shaka still clings on to hope that his father will teach him how to be a great warrior and king. Shaka notifies his mother that he will return to Guanobamba and attempt to reconcile with his father and learn from him. However, when Shaka arrived in Guanobamba and reunited with Senza del Kona for the first time in a decade, the narcissistic king once again banished Shaka from the kingdom. But before he departed, his great uncle and aunt Ngabai encouraged Shaka to be patient, telling him that his birthright as a prince will never leave him. On his return to Mtandeni, on his return to Mtandeni, Nandi encouraged Shaka to take up Godongwane's offer. On his return to Mtandeni, Nandi encouraged Shaka to take up Gedengwane's offer, and the episode ends with Shaka training as part of his surrogate's father's army. And the episode ends with Shaka training as part of his surrogate father's army. Episode 9 begins with Dinyiswayo returning to his homeland, backed by the Subi and Mabudu warriors. On their march to Mteto, Dinyiswayo acquired a horse from a missionary named Dr. Cohen. And by acquiring, I mean he stole it. Dinyiswayo reunited with Ngomani in preparation for war. But in a final attempt to avoid bloodshed of his own people, Dinyiswayo paid Mawewe a visit, strongly urging him to surrender. Meanwhile, in Kwabe, Shaka continued his training, regularly sparring against Prince Pukatwai, sharpening his skills until he was ready for battle. And battle would soon come as Mawewe arrived in Kwabe, requesting warriors to aid him in his fight for the Mteta throne. Mawewe's request was granted, with Dinyiswayo leading his army in battle against a largely Kwabe army led by Gedengan. Dinyiswayo's smaller army dominated, led by passion until Shaka inspired his brethren in a moment of reckless bravery resulting in Gerenyane's death. Having lost their general, Shaka and his brothers quickly retreated to Kwabe, where word had spread of their defeat, with a heartbroken Nandi ripping Shaka for his carelessness and lack of discipline that led to Gerenyane's death. Shortly after, the Yusuayo arrived in Kwabe, demanding that they hand over Mawewe. However, he showed mercy and spared his brother's life, exiling him but first cutting out his tongue, dooming him to a possible encounter with the European slave traders. The episode ends with Dinyiswayo marching into Mteta, where he took up his mantle as King Dinyiswayo Wabamtetu. <laughs> Episode 10 picks up with a return to Ndwandwe, where Zide has grown stronger. It's revealed that battle lines are being drawn between the Ndwandwe and the Mteta, with Zide seeking vengeance for his loss and capture at the hands of Godongwana earlier in the season. Meanwhile, Dinyiswayo had become vigilant of the growing Ndwandwe threat, revealing that Zuida's kingdom now controlled all the trade routes to the Portuguese, something which was previously under the Mteto's control. Dinyiswayo's journey to claiming the Mteto throne took over a decade, and in that time, Zuida's kingdom and army had grown stronger. For this reason, Dinyiswayo sought an alliance with the other Nguni tribes that would unite them in trade and militarily against the Ndwandwe. However, the other tribes refused to be united under the Mteto, this sparked the series of battles, with Dinyiswayo using war to force the other tribes into pledging loyalty to the Mteta. Following Gerenyane's death, Nandi and Shaka moved to Mteta, where Dinyiswayo welcomed them and drafted Shaka into the Mteta army under the Izikwe regiment. 
Shaka quickly showed his peers and the Isayo that he was a true warrior and born leader when he rounded up some of his comrades to confront a cattle thief in the forest. The cattle thief was an urban legend amongst them Tetwa, called Lembe, with many believing he could not be stopped until Shaka and his comrades returned with the king's cattle, which they were ultimately rewarded with. Shaka went on to become the leader of his regiment, training them and leading them in war. After a victory over the Ngwane, Dingiswayo set his sights on Elangeni in the hope that the king will pledge his loyalty to the Mteto without any blood being spilt. However, it's revealed that the ruler of Elangeni is now Makedam, Shaka's cousin and childhood nemesis the same one he wounded before fleeing Elangeni as a young boy. Dingiswayo's message arrives in Elangeni, and word reaches in Dwandwe that Elangeni are the next target for them Teta. The episode ends with Zide, his goblin brother and mother, plotting to assist Elangeni in the impending conflict with them Teta. <laughs> I see Possum Court on a Mosca, Mobaloco, Uguilasa. No one alum condoa, Mumfushan. In Tiswa and in Tiswa, I'm Mamulum Condoaio, Ulingan in Oami. Skid. Couldn't say it on. Episode 11 picks up with Zide receiving a message from Elangeni. Shortly after, a royal delegation from Elangeni, led by Makedama, arrived in Ndwandwe. Despite Queen Ntombazi's objections, Makedama and Zwide formed an alliance. The newly formed Ndwandwe and Elangeni army, led by Makedama and Thija, set off for battle. Word of Makedama and Zwide teaming up arrives in Mtetwa, where Shaka continues to be Dinyiswayo's most trusted general and has set his sights on a young Mtetwa maiden named Vundlazi. Shaka would ultimately have his heart broken when the king's son, Somveli, stole the affections of Vundlazi. Shaka had no time to dwell on the disappointment and prepared his unit for the battle with his cousin, Makedam. He gave his bees to Nandi, then went off to fight for Dini Swayo and his mother's honor. Upon arriving at the battlefield, Shaka's army was greatly outnumbered and he deployed the legendary short spear strategy in which they charged at the enemy with their shields up in a turtle formation. Shaka's men boxed the enemy in and slaughtered them. By the time the battle was over, the ground was soaked in Ndwandwe and Elangeni blood, but death evaded Makadam, who had cowardly fled the battlefield. Klija, the Ndwandwe general, also lived to tell the tale of their defeat, but the captured Elangeni men would not be so lucky. Despite Ngomani trying to stop him, a ruthless Shaka, having been bullied by many of them as a youngster, ordered that the captured Elangeni men be slaughtered, something which was against him Tetwa army protocol. Dingi Swayo nonetheless ordered that Shaka and his men receive a hero's welcome. The episode ends with the celebration of the Mteto victory, with Shaka showering his mother with praise for raising him to be the man he is. Inkosi, your pindila namwa nobama namusha. Isengunzas bili, basla is basinya. No mai, ingi pukwa kona. Kepa loko. Episode 12, the finale, picks up in Ndwandwe, where Makedama has returned alone, making it clear to Zwide that he fled from the battlefield. Makedama ultimately paid with his life as Queen Ntombazi fed him to her pet hyenas. Meanwhile, Nandi returns to Guanobamba in an effort to secure Shaga's legacy. To that end, Senzagakona's mother tries to convince her son to restore Shaga as the heir to the Zulu throne, which he refuses. Back in Mtetwa, Dingiswayo and Shaka have their sights set on the Zulu kingdom inviting Senzaga Kona and his people for a celebration where Shaka and his father came face to face for the first time since he was a small boy. Shaka demanded his father take him back to Guanobamba and restore him as his heir, but Senza refused, deciding to round up his people and leave him Tetwa. On the Zulu's journey back home, Senzaga Kona fell ill 
with Mkabai suggesting her brother may have been poisoned. Senza would not live long after falling ill, and as the Zulu kingdom prepared Skujana to take the throne, Mkabai campaigned for Shaka to rule instead. Word arrives of Senza Gakona's death, and Shaka prepares to return to Guanobam. Little does he know that his uncle Umut has convinced Gujana that Shaka must die, so they invite him over in a planned ambush. However, Mkabai was able to warn Shaka in advance, so Shaka and his men were ready for the ambush, killing Gujana and Umuti after he failed to pledge his loyalty. With Gujana dead, Shaka was left unchallenged for the Zulu throne, and the episode ends with Shaka accompanied by his army and mother finally returning to Guanobamba and reclaiming the Zulu throne. It's a wrap for season 1. If you guys remember, I did predict that the season might end at this point with Shaka's coronation as the Zulu king. Really enjoyed watching and reviewing this first season of Shaka Ilembe. Thank you all for the support. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more reviews. This is ASR for the love of African filmmaking and storytelling. Thank <laughs> you.